you all for joining us this morning for a webinar to launch and discuss a new IISD paper by Dr. Esme Shello that explores approaches of international courts and tribunals to the Howard of compensation in international private property cases and considers implications for the reform of investor state dispute settlement. My name is Susie Nikiema and I'm the lead of the Sustainable Investment Work Stream at ISD. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar and to introduce our estimated speakers and outline our agenda for today. Dr. Esme Shirlo is an associate professor, professor sorry, at the Australian National University who teaches Australian National University where long of public settlement and international investment law and arbitration. We are delighted to have collaborated with Esme to produce this comparative study on compensation and are looking forward to hearing her present the key findings and recommendation from the paper. After Esme's presentation, we will be joined by an estimate panel of experts to further unpack the recommendations and implications of the paper, in particular, its relevance for ISDS reform. We are honored to be joined by three eminent experts. Dr. Veronika Fikfak is an associate professor in human rights law at the Center of Excellence for International Courts at the University of Copenhagen, with a focus on damages for human rights violations by states. Mm -hmm. Simon Batifor is a partner at the international law firm Curtis Mallet Prevost Colt and Mosley and managing partner of the firm's Brussels office, whose practice focuses on representing states in investment treaty arbitration. Last but not least, Dr. Martin Paparinskis is a reader in international public law at the University College London with a special interest in international law investment and international dispute settlement. My sincere thanks to each of you for making your time available to join our discussion today. Following our panel discussion, we will have an opportunity to hear from some reflections and reactions from some government officials working in international investment law and policy, following which we hope to take some questions from the floor, but please do share your questions and reflection in the chat at any time. But before Esme's presentation, uh, Esme present on the paper, my colleague Sarah Bruin will share some brief remarks to frame where the paper sits in ISD's work on the critical issue of compensation under international investment law and what we hope to achieve with it. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susie. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. So before we get into our discussion about this exciting new paper authored by Esme, I thought it would be important to just frame more broadly why we're here to talk about the practice of other international courts and tribunals in awarding compensation in international property cases, and why this is relevant to investor state dispute settlement, and also more broadly, why we think this issue of compensation is so important and so right for reform. So back in 2020, Jonathan Benicia and I co-authored a paper on compensation under investment treaties. And in that paper, we were trying to set out what we saw as the problems with current approaches to compensation in ISDS and to help contribute to a broader discussion and a conversation around possible reform solutions to those problems. So on the side of problems, we, we noted that ISDS awards are large and getting larger with awards in the multi-millions and sometimes billions of dollars. And we also highlighted um, sort of an anomalous set of cases where large awards of compensation are being made in the context of regulatory disputes, even where investments continue to operate um, or where large amounts of compensation are awarded for an interference with a planned investment that never um, becomes operational. So those were a certain set of problems that we identified in that paper. And we also identified the fact that arbitral approaches to awarding compensation are inconsistent, increasingly complex and expensive. And we flagged that investment tribunal practices tend to depart from the approaches that we see 
in international courts and other international tribunals in similar types of cases. And it's really this last point here that we're seeking to thoroughly interrogate. Carte qui nous cherchons à interroger en profondeur afin de, de, de mieux le comprendre grâce à ce document qui a été rédigé par Esme. Donc, le, le canalizar estas prácticas de los tribunales internacionales para traer nuevas approaches to awarding compensation in ISDS. Because something that we continue to find remarkable about this issue is how little new reform thinking and concrete ideas there are to date. And when we compare this to the new generation treaty language on the substantive investment protection side of things, or processes established to reform ISDS procedure, it's really remarkable how little attention this crucial issue of compensation has received um, in these reform discussions. So at ISD, we're trying to focus more attention on this issue of compensation. Um, this is now our fourth in a series of webinars on the topic, and this new paper authored by Esme will be our third publication. And we really hope that this paper will help to contribute to um, an, a bank of ideas of reform from which states can draw to help develop new and better approaches to the award of compensation under international investment treaties. Because we do believe that if some of these problems of compensation can be fixed, this will be one important piece of the overall puzzle of systemic reform in international investment law so that it can become a driver of and not an impediment to sustainable development. So with those um, broad framing remarks, I'd like to now hand over to Esme, who's going to take us through the paper before we turn to our um, esteemed panel for a discussion. Thank you very much, Esme. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. And, and thanks to you, Susie, and the IASD team for organising this webinar and to Simone, Veronica and Martins for taking part. Um, really looking forward to hearing the comments on the paper and to discussing its findings and implications for investor state arbitration reform in more detail. Uh, before I begin, uh, I wanted to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and also to extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today with us in the webinar. I'd also like to thank IISD for inviting me to prepare this policy paper and particularly uh, note the, the efforts of Sarah, Lucas Schwag and Anchi Wang for their input during the drafting process, which really helped to, to bring the paper together and, and to crystallise what you see on the page uh, today. So I thought I'd spend the next 10 or so minutes uh, introducing the paper just as a way of providing some context for the discussion that will follow, um, particularly as the paper's just been launched. So uh, I realise not all participants will have had a chance to, to read it in any depth uh, as yet. Uh, so as Sarah explained, uh, this project was sparked by IISD's existing work on compensation in investor state arbitration. Uh, and one question that arose as part of that work was how other international courts and tribunals approach similar issues of compensation to those that arise in investor state disputes. And the paper we're launching today seeks to answer this question by analyzing approaches to compensation in cases concerning alleged state interferences with private property uh, before other international courts and tribunals. And it focuses specifically on uh, the approaches towards compensation adopted by the Permanent Court of International Justice, the International Court of Justice, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, um, Annex 7 tribunals under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and uh, European, African and Inter-American Regional Human Rights Courts. The paper is divided thematically so that it can cover several cross-cutting themes associated with the approaches of these courts and, and tribunals to awards of compensation. Um, so it first outlines the approaches of these courts and tribunals towards setting the standard by reference to which reparation is awarded upon a finding of a breach of international law. Uh, and this part of the paper highlights that most international courts work by reference to the customary international law standard of full reparation when analysing remedies rather than by reference to other rules or standards. And in applying that standard of full reparation, most international courts and tribunals 
have adopted the view that reparation must aim to wipe out the consequences of internationally wrongful acts and re-establish the situation that would have existed but for the breach. The paper, having dealt with uh, the standards uh, for reparation, then turns to the forms or types of reparation that have been awarded by these international courts and tribunals to achieve that standard of full reparation. Uh, and the paper notes that international courts and tribunals have accepted, at least in principle, that restitution is to be favoured as the remedy under customary international law. However, certain practical considerations, including the difficulties associated with enforcing restitutionary relief, have meant that awards of compensation are also particularly common in the practice of these international courts and tribunals. The paper thirdly addresses the types of loss or damage for which compensation has been awarded by these international courts and tribunals. Uh, and it examines here awards of compensation for both material and non-material damage. And it also highlights the different valuation techniques that have been used by these courts and tribunals to uh, value compensation for these types of loss. And the paper outlines in this section several cases in which international courts and tribunals have awarded compensation for material loss, noting uh, that courts have often adopted market income and asset-based valuation techniques, but have also at times valued material loss by reference to equitable techniques. And the paper notes that uh, those equitable techniques have also proven particularly influential in assessing non-material harms. And it explores precisely what an equitable approach to valuation means in practice, highlighting in particular the considerable discretion associated with such valuation techniques on the part of courts and tribunals. This section of the paper also explores the practice of international courts and tribunals in relation to the award of compensation for lost profits and also their various uses of procedures to support their analysis of compensation, including, for example, the engagement of many international courts and tribunals of tribunal appointed valuation experts. The paper fourthly examines the various requirements imposed by international courts and tribunals when awarding compensation. And it focuses specifically on requirements of a causation, mitigation of loss and non-contribution to loss. And it explores the role of these requirements as well as divergences in international practice, particularly as concerns the delineation of the requisite causal link uh, between an internationally wrongful act and an alleged loss in order to give rise uh, to compensation for an international, uh, international law breach. And finally, uh, the paper examines the approaches adopted by these international courts and tribunals to awarding interest, including their propensity to award simple versus compound interest and the range of interest rates selected in doing so. And based on that thematic discussion, the paper really aims to highlight how the practice of these other international courts and tribunals to these issues of compensation might offer ideas and inspiration for those engaged in investor state arbitration reform efforts. And to that end, the paper concludes by highlighting several options that states might wish to consider when thinking about how approaches to compensation in investor state arbitration could be reformed. The paper notes, for instance, uh, that states could consider crafting new treaty language to expressly require investor state tribunals to apply a different standard of reparation to that which is provided under customary international law. So replacing that full reparation standard with a, a standard of fair, reasonable, partial, or other some other standard of reparation. Um, and it suggests in doing so, states could conceivably also distinguish between the standards of compensation that will be due for particular types of breaches or for particular types of loss. The paper next explores, uh, should states wish to retain that, that customary standard of full reparation, the options that they might have to give tribunals greater guidance as to how to give effect to that standard in practice. So that could include, uh, for instance, directions concerning the types of reparation available or preferred for different types of breaches, the types of loss or damage for which reparation may be provided, and the quantification methods capable of identifying what will constitute full reparation for such loss or damage in any individual case. The paper also suggests that states could provide greater guidance on uh, things like uh, approaches to causation uh, and applicable approaches to interest, including interest rates, the periods of time from which interest will apply and whether interest ought to be applied on a simple or a compound basis.
In addition to these reform options, the paper also highlights several procedural innovations in the practice of other international courts and tribunals relevant to awards of compensation for treaty breaches that could be picked up in the investor state context. Uh, for example, it highlights that international courts or tribunals can work in a more or less complementary fashion to domestic processes. So one reform option for investor state disputes might therefore be to require tribunals to give uh, to have greater engagement with or give greater deference to domestic decisions relevant to reparation. Some international courts, for example, require applicants to use domestic procedures to secure compensation before the court will make a ruling as to whether any or additional reparation is required for the breach of international law. And some international courts also elaborate principles to guide domestic analyses of reparation following the court's finding on the merits of a breach of international law. So the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, as an example, has directed competent national authorities uh, to fix the amount of compensation for a breach of international law that it has found, either in accordance with domestic law rules or uh, by reference to objective, reasonable and effective criteria. Linked to this, the paper also finds that some international courts are particularly active in encouraging parties to reach negotiated or mediated settlements of, on matters of reparation following a judicial decision on the merits. So those sorts of decisions uh, can be achieved through bifurcation or trifurcation of proceedings with the tribunal giving a framework decision as to the merits, which it then leaves uh, to the parties to negotiate uh, uh, an implementation of through a, a more precise uh, determination by those parties, either through negotiation or mediation of uh, a settlement option. Um, several international courts and tribunals also appoint, as I've mentioned, their own experts to value loss rather than relying on party appointed experts. Finally, uh, the paper highlights several elements which may not be practicable, appropriate or desirable to adopt in the context of the current investor state arbitration regime. Uh, so equitable approaches to awarding compensation are, for instance, likely to lead only to greater inconsistency and unpredictability in awards of compensation. And so they might actually undercut uh, the goals of other reform efforts. Awards of restitutionary relief may also be impracticable or undesirable. And some states for this reason are adopting provisions in investment treaties, expressly reserving their right to elect to pay compensation in lieu of restitution uh, to reflect those, those difficulties. And really those considerations show, uh, as I've noted in my other uh, work, uh, the interconnected nature of reform efforts. So any reforms to address one issue like compensation may themselves generate unintended impacts in other areas and may inadvertently undercut uh, other reform goals. Um, and so for that reason, it is really important to have uh, regard to how all of these approaches function in other regimes in practice uh, and, and whether they're feasible and desirable uh, for transplanting into investor state arbitration, whether they might need adapting to work within that context or whether they only can work uh, in their specific institutional context uh, in, in the context of the other international court or tribunal. So really it's necessary to consider these reform options quite holistically and by reference to the precise institutional context and legal frameworks within which uh, investor state disputes are arbitrated. So really the main message then underlying uh, the paper is that investor state reform efforts are likely to benefit from recontextualizing that regime within the broader context of public international law. And applying this lens brings into focus lessons and opportunities from the practice of other international courts and tribunals in relation to specific reform options. Uh, and it further indicates that any effective reform of approaches to compensation in investor state arbitration may need to be achieved through coherent or comprehensive institutional substantive and or procedural reforms. So that's really uh, the paper in a nutshell. Uh, and I'll look forward to discussing the paper and its implications and to hearing the views of our assembled uh, panelists uh, as we unpack the, the findings of the paper in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you so much, Esme. And um, I think you did a, a brilliant job of uh, capturing in a nutshell, a very rich um, and uh, comprehensive paper, which has been um, published yesterday, I believe, and the link to which has been shared um, by Lucas in the chat for those who would like to read it in greater detail.
Um, but I think it was really, really helpful to start with that framing. And what we'd like to do now with our panel discussion is really unpack um, some of these reform options and some of these procedural innovations that you've highlighted in the paper as, um, as being sources of inspiration from practices of other international courts and tribunals. And I think what, what we've tried to do with this um, wonderful panel that we've assembled is really bring people who are going to offer different perspectives on these um, reform options and, and innovations. Um, to your point, Esme, about the interconnected nature of these reforms and the fact that we need to be taking a holistic um, approach and also considering quite carefully how feasible, how desirable some of these reforms would be to bring from one context to another. So we hope that we can bring different perspectives who can, um, of, of people who can comment really on how well some of these policy innovations might um, transplant across to investor state arbitration. So thank you very much. And um, with that, I'm gonna jump now straight into our panel discussion. Um, and I have my first question here um, for, for Simon. Um, and I'd really love to hear your perspective um, from a practitioner um, about whether investment tribunals tend to look beyond the world of investment arbitration when they're making their awards generally. Um, so what is the practice firstly, and then what would be your view on whether they should be doing so more often, less often, um, whether this is really a, a pertinent question. So thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Sarah. So first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank you, uh, Suzy Nikema and IASD for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to be here and in such distinguished company. Second, I would like to congratulate Esme Shirlo and IASD for this comprehensive, well-written and thought-provoking paper. Um, now coming to your question, do investment tribunals look beyond the world of investment arbitration when rendering their awards of compensation? I think the answer is yes and no. Um, yes, because many, if not all awards contain references to basic principles of customer international law governing compensation. The most commonly cited sources are the choice of factory judgment of the Permanent Court of International Justice on the standard of full reparation and the customary international law rules on compensation codified in the ILC's articles on state responsibility. <clears throat> the reason for this is simple. With the exception of expropriation clauses, investment treaties generally do not contain rules regarding compensation. That's why tribunals have had to turn to principles established under customary international law. So that's the yes part. Now, um, I also say no, because in the actual application of those basic principles, tribunals have deviated in some important respects from the practice of other international courts and tribunals. One of the main examples concerns valuation methods for assets other than going concerns with a history of profitability. You alluded to this uh, earlier, Sarah. Um, so traditionally, when a business does not have a documented history of profitability, international courts and tribunals have found that it would be overly speculative and impermissible to apply valuation methods that assume the ongoing operation of the business in the future such as the discounted cash flow methodology, the famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, DCF method. The commentary of the ILC articles I just mentioned state that in cases where a business is not a going concern, then breakup, liquidation, or dissolution value is generally employed by international courts and tribunals. The ILC was not referring to investment arbitration, but to the practice of other international courts and tribunals. The ILC commentary goes on to observe that those tribunals, quote, have been reluctant to provide compensation for claims with inherently speculative elements, and that the DCF method rests precisely on such inherently speculative elements, especially regarding projections of profits way down in the future. So one might think that investment treaty tribunals turning to the ILC articles to identify the principles governing compensation would also take into account the practice of international courts and tribunals based on which the ILC articles were elaborated. 
one might therefore assume that investment tribunals would take into account the caution expressed by those international courts and tribunals with respect to inherently speculative evaluation methodologies. And to be fair, for some time, most investment tribunals actually exercise a degree of caution, refusing to apply, for example, the DCF method to value investments that had no history of profitability. But as the field evolved, the claimants in those cases have been pushing tribunals more and more to break away from this practice. And we're seeing now more and more tribunals willing to do so and venturing into extremely speculative applications of the DCF method to businesses with no history of profitability. And in some cases that have not even received the required approvals from the host state for operating. Using the DCF method in such cases can have enormous implications, potentially making the quantum of compensation leap from the million dollar range to the billion dollar range in the same case. So even though tribunals are formally basing their decisions on the principles expressed in Trozo, the ILC articles, we're actually seeing important departures from the way in which other international courts and tribunals have applied those principles. Of course, this is not the only area of investment law where we're seeing trends that can seem divorced from the approaches followed by other international courts and tribunals. A lot has been written on how many tribunals have interpreted treaties in a way that is de-anchored from public international law. But with compensation, the problem is particularly acute because the large and in some cases monumental amounts of compensation that tribunals are awarding can have devastating effects on host states. Thank you. Thank you so much for that extremely clear and comprehensive answer and really in your final words kind of bringing us back to to very much the the rationale for this entire discussion we're really talking about these monumental awards. Um, that impose this enormous burden on states and developing states, particularly so so thank you so much and really important and interesting to hear about this this de anchoring problem that we're seeing in uh, investment tribunals. And perhaps I could turn now to Veronica. Um, we'll see how we go with your internet connection. If I need to pivot, I will. Um, but we'd like to hear more about the approach of other international courts and tribunals um, and the extent to which they engage in comparative practice and um, the cross fertilization of approaches and ideas that that brings out. Um, and we, we see in the paper that this is happening in these other regimes a lot more than in investment arbitration. So could you speak to what this looks like in practice and what you think perhaps some of the tangible outcomes of this cross fertilization um, are? Super, thank you so much uh, uh, for the invitation. I'm gonna second what Simone said uh, and, and thank you Isma for a really fantastic paper. I think it covers so many jurisdictions and really engages, I, I would say, on a general level with the issues that are currently being discussed, you know, around the world in relation to reparations and damages. So fantastic. Um, in relation to, to your question, what I would say is that I think it's important to sort of, as a starting point, to remember that, and, and I'm mostly going to be talking about permanent international courts and tribunals, right? So institutions. And, and they, they seem to be facing very similar questions and similar dilemmas. And, and those dilemmas are about you know, what kind of evidence do you take into account to determine damages? What is good? What is persuasive evidence? Is there a, a causal link uh, that you're trying to establish? What do you need to establish that? What approach do you take? As Esme said, market value or equitable treatment. Um, and then what, you know, what level do you set damages at? Um, and do you have discretion there or not? And I think here, especially when I'm looking at the permanent institution, they have really, really taken an opportunity to learn from each other, I would say. And here I'm thinking both uh, about human rights courts, but also, you know, the ICJ. And, and there are two ways that these institutions sort of learn from each other. One is through jurisprudence. And I think Simone already touched on some of that. Um, and, and Esme's paper, I think, does that really wonderfully. Um, and, and, you know, you can do that by essentially looking at which court adopts a full reparation approach, uh, how do they uh, uh, approach the question of burden of proof, so what do you need to have to establish, 
um, the fact that they, for example, said global sums uh, uh, as one approach. But I think even if, when you're looking at the jurisprudence, one of the things that the courts are clarifying or crystallizing is how they're different. So the, the learning element is not necessarily about copying each other, but it's actually about distilling how you want to be different and what is it about your jurisdiction that is specific, that is different. So the Inter-American Court of Human Rights approaches reparations in a way of changing states from within, right? Trying to really prevent any repetitive violations from taking place, whilst the ECHR is much more conservative, much less interventionist, and really is there just, I don't want to say just to, but to say these are the damages that you, you, you should receive based on what has happened. Now, the other way that cross-fertilization happens is an informal way. And that's really judges meeting with each other, judges debating and talking on the phone, but also in person about how to, and how to approach the issue of setting damages, but also what amount to do it at. And I think this applies especially to, you know, the, the approach of equitable compensation or the global sum approaches which uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but they're always set at these very large, but very, uh, you know, clear amounts. So it's always 60 million. It's not 60 million and a hundred pounds or, or something like that, right? It's always at a very um, clear number. Uh, and there, there's a psychological element to that, right? That we can imagine what 60 million looks like, but but not six, 60 million in, in one pound. Um, so, and in these kind of cases, what happens, and I think this is, for example, with Diallo, which was one of the first cases when, where the International Court of Justice actually had to think about how do you value life? What's a life worth? Um, how do you assess damage to persons? Um, and these kind of questions are questions that the European Court of Human Rights resolves on, on an almost, I'll say, daily basis. So, you know, it has these ladders, it has these scales internally of how it would assess, but the ICJ didn't have that. And so th th there was this internal discussion um, and also discussion with the European Court of Human Rights of how these numbers should be set and what's the reasoning behind it. Um, and I think these informal gatherings and chats are really important and, and really helpful to judges because in some sense, they are not accountants. And so, you know, they're also not in a domestic system where we, we have these almost like a menu of what each damage is worth, right? We don't have that on an international level. So I think there's much more cross-fertilization happening that we're aware of in an informal way. And one of the things, for example, that the European Court of Human Rights looks at when it's setting equitable damages, or they define it as reasonable, is they look at whether or not the country will be able to pay the compensation. So is, and if, if they feel it won't, they will reduce the amount that the equation shows them. And so these are the kind of things that you could learn from each other, uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So I'll stop there, but thank you very much for a wonderful paper. Thank you, Veronica. And um, yeah, really interesting to hear um, how this practice of cross-fertilization occurs. And, and I think interesting that you note that these are all um, institutionalized courts with sitting judges. And I think that goes to Esme's point around how some of these practices maybe are more or less appropriate across different regimes. So thank you so much. Um, and I'd like now to turn to Martin's um, because we've spoken a bit about what investment tribunals are doing, um, about what are the international courts and tribunals are doing, but I'd like to sort of explore perhaps what we think states are doing when they're concluding their investment treaties. And I'd like to ask, do you think that states, when they are signing investment treaties um, or developing models, are they seeing them as an instrument that should sit against a backdrop of public international law? Um, and do you see this broadly as an issue? Um, thank you, Sarah. And um, the great benefit of being the last one to speak is that I can incorporate by reference all the warm words um, expressed by the previous speakers regarding the organizers and Esme's wonderful 
paper, and may I particularly uh, single out uh, Susie, whose uh, patience uh, behind the scenes has really, in my view, been instrumental here. So everybody wonderfully done. So really with a profound question of how we think about this and how states think about this. And I have four points that I want to make here. So Sarah asked the question whether states, when concluding treaties, situate uh, their activities against the broader backdrop. And perhaps the basic point is that by simply engaging in that vocabulary, simply by acting within the international legal order, we are necessarily situating oneself within a public international law. So even in the question, there are certain unspoken, as it were, constitutional assumptions that states are actors in public international law. And with that comes a certain constitutional institutional baggage of sovereign equality and particular relationships between states, the ability to engage in a particular lawmaking activity in public international law through treaties and customary law, drafting, as it were, against the background of the broader canvas, uh, the body of rules on rules, on actors, on sources, particularly treaties, and also importantly for this talk responsibility. So I think at the first point, I think, you know, analytically speaking, a point that might go without saying, but even better by being said, of course. I think the second uh, point is that that strikes me as particularly uh, likely uh, when thinking about investment law, because investment law, of course, has historically been situated within the broader body of public international law. I think as he's been quite persuasively argued that investment treaties came into being in the particular moment of development of international law as one of the countervailing factors to debates about the content and indeed existence of customary international law and the protection of foreign investment within the General Assembly and later in the International Law Commission. So plainly, this is something that was purported to uh, be situated as part of the broader legal discussion. I think, and I think if we particularly think about compensation, it is also the case that states would be familiar with the idea that a compensation is likely to arise out of international treaties. We may think of states analytically as a black box, but of course in real life, there are things that would be uh, we're dropping on people's uh, desks or in contiguous desks or desks in contiguous institutions. So there will be people dealing with investment treaties, but at the next table, there will be people dealing with, in, Europe, in European countries, with European Court of Human Rights, in Latin America, with Inter-American Court. In the Middle East, they would be dealing with or would have heard of the Iran-United States Claims Tribunal, United Nations Compensation Commission. So that is likely, although of course, I think that there is a rather big omission in the standard judicialization story that most of these things would not really be taking place in Asia. Uh, so uh, there, I think, is an interesting question mark about the sheer routineness of uh, compensation that might be more familiar in some settings, particularly in Europe, and less familiar as, a, as it were everyday bread and butter work of states in other settings. Which leads me to my third point, and that is, I think that backdrop uh, does not mean that we willy-nilly incorporate everything, and that is, I think, the great insight of Esme's paper, that we have to be sensitive to the institutional context, that international law itself provides us with a sophisticated framework of sources and responsibility, and particularly jurisdiction and applicable law through which we sort the bigger applicable universe and insert it in a particular setting. And if we look at the way how the leading authorities have have dealt with that, we have precisely that nuance. We have it in the Diallo compensation judgment, and that was a point that Veronica alluded to, uh, something that uh, International Court did not have a great deal of experience with, but other institutions did. So they uh, drew upon it. Similarly, the International Law Commission's work has addressed it in sort of in a similarly nuanced way. If we look at Article 36 and its commentaries, particularly Commentary 6, ILC is trying to deal with the same tension. And it, the way how it expressed is that 
the rules and principles developed by bodies other than the international court in assessing compensation can be seen as manifestations of the general principle. So there is that tension between the institutional sensitivities and a certain overreaching idea and principle. And if I may conclude, which is really my last point that I want to make, I think that what strikes me as very interesting in investment law is that it, uh, in a way, it forces us to confront the full implications of the law of state responsibility, which in other settings will be modulated by something else, whether simply by the practicalities of the rarity of states bringing claims or the unwillingness to generate in a repeat player setting unpleasant precedents, or the political bodies like in the regional human rights setting on enforcement that modulates that. So investment arbitration has nothing of that sort. So in the sense, it pushes the argument to the legal one, which in other settings may be addressed by political settings. So in short, it absolutely situated against the backdrop, but that doesn't really answer the question. It simply sharpens it. Thank you so much, Martins. Um, and thank you, really for all of these um, useful reflections that help us kind of broadly contextualize the approach of the paper. Um, I'd like to get into a second round of questions that look more to some of the specific um, reform options and, and whether and how they might be relevant and appropriate in the context of ISDS. But before I did, we're doing quite well for time. So I did just want to offer Esme an opportunity to um, respond to any of those um interventions or if you prefer to keep um to the end that's also fine so um no, i can respond now and, and thank you to the panelists for uh, all of those really i think rich insights um and i, I think quite complementary insights into how um, investment tribunals use uh the approaches from other areas of international law and, and maybe also how they could use those approaches more fully. Um, I think kind of picking up on, on those comments, I'd say that in, in some ways, as Simon uh, mentioned, the, the kind of the context of public international law is almost assumed uh, in the context of investment arbitration, because many of these treaties don't specify in any particular detail what should happen once a breach of international law is found, which really means that, as Martins was saying, that the rules of state responsibility come into play and then and then the question is really well how it, how are those rules of state responsibility being implemented in the investment uh, context and and really that's where we get a, a divergence in interpretations as to what is required from from what other international courts and tribunals uh, might be thinking about on on similar issues and um, I think really kind of one of the purposes of the paper is to highlight that um, other international courts and tribunals, as Veronica's mentioned, are dealing with very similar issues and, and similar complexities and are coming up with ways and solutions around uh, those complexities and, and investment tribunals may be able to learn something uh, from those approaches, both in terms of what's possible and desirable, but also what's not working and needs changing. Um, and so in many ways, I think, um, kind of the, the call underlying the paper is really um, these approaches of other international courts and tribunals should be adopted or dismissed uh, by investment tribunals with cognizance that they're actually uh, kind of in play in other settings. And, and so kind of drawing attention to um, uh, these various different approaches that exist both for practitioners uh, uh, in investment disputes, but uh, principally for states that are responsible for drafting the rules under which those disputes are arbitrated. And, and really there are uh, various ways where that knowledge of, of other approaches can be boosted, including through IASD's work in, in researching comparative approaches and through papers like this, but uh, also in terms of thinking about who's in the room, designing these rules, um, as, as Martin has said, often states are operating uh, through different teams with different focal points and they don't necessarily always come together. So first step might be bringing um, negotiating teams together to compare uh, approaches that are being adopted in, in different settings, but equally kind of uh, embedding both public international law experts and, and experts in specialised regimes of international law like human rights in negotiating teams for investment uh, treaties and also in multilateral reform discussions related to investment arbitration 
may be one way of just kind of broadening the horizon of, of the discussion that's taking place uh, around compensation and, and bringing some of these approaches into the spotlight for consideration. Thank you so much, Esme. Um, so I'll keep moving. We have a few more um, points for discussion. Um, I wanted to turn now to some of the um, policy recommendations or considerations um, in the paper and to get some views on the sort of desirability or practicality um, of, these, um, of these ideas. And my first question is for you, Veronica, um, and it touches on this idea that investment tribunals could be greater encouraged to engage with domestic mechanisms as do some of the um, standing international courts considered in the paper. And I'm interested in your perspective from the human rights context, what do you see needs to be in place, both at the domestic level and at the international level for this type of approach to be really effective? Mm -hmm. So I think there are two points at which engagement with domestic mechanisms can take place. Um, one is before damages have been set. So, for example, in the human rights context, there has been a lot of a push uh, from a number of different angles that really, for example, the European Court of Human Rights or Inter-American Court of Human Rights should not be the ones to set damages uh, in these cases because they're not close enough to the, you know, to the event where it happened because they don't know the cultural, let's say, or le legal culture of the country and how that sets damages and that essentially... Uh, damages should be said by a domestic court. Um, now, um, uh, what the European Court of Human Rights has tried to do in response to that is that it has essentially uh, adjusted damages according to the GDP of the country so that you have the same purchasing power. Um, but, but the problem, I guess, that uh, you know, is being singled out is that different domestic courts will have different cultural approaches to damages. So UK courts would be very generous to setting damages, whilst continental European courts, very conservative in terms of awarding damages. And so um, the argument there is um, that you would get very different damage amounts. The other element from a human rights perspective that is of concern is the question of independence of a domestic court, especially now that we have rule of law discussions, right? The question of a domestic court being captured, uh, the idea that politicians might prevent a domestic court from um, sort of uh, setting damages at a higher level or that they would appoint people to the court in a way. So th there, there are these concerns about letting domestic courts, even though they're closer to the ground and understand the legal culture, there are concerns about how that would work. And that's why, at least in the human rights context, that has not happened. Um, so, so that's sort of one angle of what could be entrusted to domestic mechanisms. The other angle is the question of enforcing the awards. So once an international tribunal or a court has set the damage awards, there's then a question of who can you really get on your side domestically that would ensure that these awards are enforced. And here I'm not only talking about enforcement in your own country, but also there's now discussion of trying to find a way where domestic courts would enforce uh, awards against third parties, uh, so third countries. Um, and here, um, again, the question is which kind of domestic laws, and here I'm thinking about human rights context, domestic laws allow these kind of claims, because these are really very much state liability claims uh, where you are trying to get a, 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 an international award enforced, or claims against a third state, um, like, for example, Russia and UCOS. Um, and so whilst I'm talking about UCOS, so there are now um, way, you know, sort of mechanisms that are being pursued and ways that are being sought in European countries, in EU countries specifically, to look at how domestic laws of those countries could be utilized to have the, this award um, uh, sort of enforced against Russian assets in a number of different EU countries. The problem is that some domestic laws may allow this, uh, but uh, often a lot of domestic laws won't allow it. And so the question there is that at the moment, what we're lacking is uh, often a legal basis. And secondly, we really don't have jurisprudence uh, 
Uh, and so we are waiting very much for domestic courts to see how they react for these enforcements to take place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. And yeah, really, really interesting to hear about this um, greater engagement with domestic mechanisms and how that can allow greater deference to um, domestic legal cultures, but also ability of the state to pay, which as we know is a really critical issue in um, development context. Um, so thank you. Um, Simon, I might turn to you now. Um, so one of the other policy ideas canvassed in the paper is that investment tribunals could be encouraged to make greater use of procedural powers to appoint um, tribunal experts as opposed to relying on party appointed experts. So I'm interested in your views from a practitioner perspective. What do you think um, of this idea? What might some of the practical implications be here? Sure. Um, so this is an interesting question that's been debated for some time and it's good that the, the paper is uh, also focusing on it and reviewing the practice of international courts and tribunals in that respect. Uh, the idea is why shouldn't tribunals themselves appoint experts and rely on their evidence to render the decisions? The idea is that such experts would be perceived as more independent than the experts appointed by the parties themselves. So the idea is appealing and we see in the paper that there's a, a, a practice in international courts and tribunals for that. Um, but we see that the parties in investment arbitration, and often on both sides, I have to say, um, are reluctant to relinquish control over that aspect of the case to an expert that they haven't themselves chosen. This is sometimes presented as something negative. The perception can be that the parties want to keep the ability to appoint their own expert because they want to improperly try to influence them. But there's another way to look at it. The parties want to make sure that they're getting a full opportunity to develop and present their position on the key issues of quantum, including by working closely with, their, with an expert of their own choosing on those issues. They might be worried that a tribunal appointed expert could quote unquote miss the point on some of the issues, where, whereas they can ensure that this does not happen with a party appointed expert. Parties also worry about the process for appointing those tribunal appointed experts. They don't necessarily trust the members of the tribunal to make the best choice in the selection of experts. And even if there's technically no conflict of interest for a particular expert, um, the parties may be worried about whether the chosen expert really has the level of competence and experience that is required to handle the very complex issues that often arise in investment arbitration. There are situations where a tribunal appointed expert could be beneficial. For example, the paper mentions several instances where the respondent had not presented expert evidence and the tribunal had only the claimant's expert report at its disposal. In such a case, the tribunals found that it made sense to have a tribunal appointed expert who could provide a different perspective from that of the claimant's expert. It's interesting also to think more broadly about the potential roles of tribunal appointed experts. Perhaps instead of seeing their role as all encompassing, replacing the party appointed experts, their mandate could be limited to assisting the tribunals with a limited set of key issues, for example, on which the tribunal is struggling. But ultimately, I think it's very delicate and potentially problematic to envision a total replacement of party appointed experts with tribunal appointed experts. If we're going to try to recalibrate investment treaty jurisprudence and avoid abuses, the main answer probably lies elsewhere in my view. Thank you so much. And yeah, really useful to have these um, perspectives to unpack some of the perhaps um, less obvious implications of, of some of the um, procedural um, solutions that are sort of explored in the paper. So thank you very much. And, and let me turn now um, to Martins. And really one of the big ideas that's underpinning all of these policy considerations or recommendations in the paper is this idea that states have the power to address concerns about current approaches to compensation by putting greater guidance on the issue in their treaty language. Because as we've heard um, a few times this morning, there really is 
very little at the moment in investment treaties on this important issue. And so I'm interested in your views as to why we actually haven't already seen a lot of innovation, innovation and, and new language um, in states treaties and whether you think we might um, start to see more um, in the future. And um, yeah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that is really a crucial key question. Um, I think I have long held a view, perhaps not shared by absolute livery, but the, that investment arbitration is not a particularly intellectually exciting field. Most of the challenges are really rather trivial from a conceptual perspective, very straightforward questions of treaty law, customary law, uh, dispute settlement. So the one topic that is a bit of an interesting outlier is really reparation, uh, where we get fairly high quality international lawyers engaging with that. So it, it is a puzzle. Why don't we have states that are usually fairly active, at least by comparison with other fields of international law and pushing back and engaging? We haven't had that. So again, I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, the first one uh, is perhaps the more obvious point that states are repeat players. And to the extent that we analytically situate the question of compensation in the same legal space for all breaches of international law, not merely investment law, but human rights law, environmental law, law and the use of force, trade law, whatever have you, as uh, International Law Commission in uh, Commentary 6 to Article 36 and International Court of Justice in Paragraph 13 of the Dialogue Compensation Judgment seem to suggest, states are in a complicated position. So I think the example that I usually use is Democratic Republic of Congo in early 2000s. So if we put ourselves in the international law team of Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC is dealing with three ICJ cases. It has just introduced in 1999 as a claimant a case against Uganda regarding armed activities. It is acting as a respondent in an investment claim uh, by Equatorial Guinea in Diallo. And in 2000, it will introduce a case against uh, Belgium regarding arrest warrant and universal jurisdiction. And it has also been a respondent in a number of cases, including the great uh, AMT and Zaire case, you know, shout out to the DRC team, the first state to challenge the principle of arbitration without privity. So states are in a tricky situation because they have to formulate propositions that would act against them in all settings when they're acting as claimants and respondents. So this is not unusual in public international law, the balance is how public international law usually works out, but that is so much more important when we are thinking about customary secondary rules. So I think it is not surprising that states are being a bit squeamish just because of the incredible impact of their views in this field. This is not going to be field limited as in other settings. Now, the other point, I think, and that is perhaps a more pragmatic one, is the degree of skepticism about the ability to provide a great deal of added detail on these matters. So if we look at the ILC work, and that was really a great debate in drafting out what turned out to be Article 36, is whether to go into detail or to remain at a level of a fairly abstract proposition to be implemented in different institutional settings. And Crawford in his third report really comes very firmly in the direction that experience suggests, as he puts it um, in paragraph 115. And if I may quote it, experience in this and other contexts shows that while illustrations can be given of the operation of equitable considerations of proportionality in international law, the attempt to specify them in detail is likely to fail. So this is something that, you know, having more detail doesn't really help us. Uh, I think that, that could be sort of the other uh, concern. And I think, um, and I think I don't differ majorly from Esme's intuitions and prescriptions. Uh, I think I sh I'm probably a bit more sympathetic to the skepticism, uh, and partly because of the addressees. Um, uh, I think we are talking about extremely sophisticated points of public international law, but uh, 
As we know, there are tribunals, not thinking of any particular tribunals, that may be even surprised to find out that there is no uh, general obligation of compensation for lawful conduct under international law. So it really kind of goes back to the point, who are the addressees? If they are sophisticated international lawyers, these things are superfluous. Uh, all the points that SME makes on causality, no punitive damages and such are already in the system. They simply need to be worked through. If they do not know even the basics of public international law, putting the basics in a more detailed way would not help us either. So that is a little bit of a puzzle that we are talking about the language, but the underlying problem of the speakers is not uh, resolved. Uh, I wonder, and I think I have argued that perhaps the focus should be less on the detail and more on more explicit acceptance and fleshing out of the principles already in the system of responsibility to restrike the balance. So again, points that SME has there, contribution and mitigation, I think, are working their way through the system. I have argued myself that perhaps crippling a compensation itself deserves a separate a principle to be addressed. Possibly, and I think that states have not been terribly good in dealing with vague principles in general, but in my view, one of the rare good examples is the uh, side letter on likeness to CPTPP. So the way to get at it perhaps is to identify good and bad examples of application of rules perhaps even for the slightly less sharp arbitrators, if they know what is to be done and what is not to be done in actual cases, rather than a level of language, they would get it a bit more quickly. But I think, so I'm extremely sympathetic to what Esme is uh, suggesting. I was, I, I suppose my question mark is how to sharpen it in a way that it would cut in the institutional context that we're actually operating in and there. I have some doubts, you know, doubts that have been running for a long time, including in Crawford's reports of what would work. This is not a straightforward thing to address. Thank you so much, um, Martins, for those reflections. And, and just a small point, I can see in the chat, someone's requested um, a citation or a link to the report of Crawford that you mentioned. So if you have a moment to um, direct um, someone to that, or perhaps we can follow up by email after the webinar. Um, so thank you all really for those um, incredibly useful reflections. And um, I might turn once again to you, Esme, to offer you an opportunity to uh, respond to some of those thoughts um, before we move to the final part of the webinar and um, take some questions and um, perhaps some interventions as well from the floor. So over to you, Esme. Right, well, well, thank you. And, and just kind of to pick up on uh, Martin's uh, comments, I, I agree. I, I think that we're likely to see increasing engagement with these issues by states in treaties, but I have my doubts as to how sophisticated or comprehensive those approaches are likely to be. And I mean, already states are beginning to engage on compensation to give a little bit more direction to investment tribunals and uh, the EU and, and Canada in their agreement. Uh, kind of pick up elements uh, of, of the approaches discussed in the paper. So, for example, there's a clause in that agreement that, that says that um, compensation shouldn't be awarded on a punitive uh, basis. And I think we're going to get probably more of those sorts of fine-tuning type provisions from states more so than anything particularly radical or comprehensive. So I don't think they're going to anytime soon states are going to throw out the, the standard of full reparation, for example, um, in, in treaty drafting that we may be surprised uh, by a, a state that adopts that approach. I think we're more likely to get these kind of incremental tweaks of, of approaches that, that specify kind of practices that are particularly desirable or undesirable and, and give some direction to tribunals to achieve that. Um, and the paper, it kind of in drafting it, uh, we were sort of hoping to almost achieve a toolbox type approach that states could go to this paper and find various options discussed along with their pros and cons and, and kind of the issues maybe they've, they've raised in other settings and how other international courts and tribunals have overcome them um, in a way that then states could pick up different threads uh, from the paper if they're not looking to do something much more radical uh, and comprehensive. 
And at the same time, I think the paper also highlights several approaches that don't necessarily rely on states uh, making those sorts of amendments to treaties or, or adopting new treaty language, um, including by highlighting how tribunals could, could use existing procedural powers to achieve some innovations in, in practice um, and, and parties uh, to, to arbitration proceedings would encourage tribunals to make greater use of those uh, existing um, powers that they have without necessarily relying on states to, to do anything particularly more radical. Um, and again, something kind of uh, Martin's touched on is it doesn't necessarily, if states are inclined to make these reforms, doesn't necessarily have to take place through treaty language. There, there can be um, side instruments and, and instruments of less than treaty status and guidelines um, that could direct tribunals towards particular approaches, particularly if we say that um, already uh, tribunals are expected to, to apply customary international law um, directions from states as to what customary international law requires, uh, presuming it's consistent with customary international law would actually be then just an application of, of already what tribunals are expected to do under those treaties. Um, and I guess then to link up to Simone and Veronica's comments, uh, it really shows, I think, in, in thinking through all of these reform options, kind of the that it pays to be really cognizant of um, potential unexpected uh, ramifications of, of really uh, going uh, all in on, on particular approaches and, and um, you know, like uh, picking up on Simone's comments around uh, experts and tribunal appointed experts. There's also additional risks of um, adopting these sorts of reform approaches, which states need to be cognizant of when they're thinking through what approaches to encourage uh, in investor state arbitration. So even for uh, beyond kind of the party concerns that Simone uh, highlighted around uh, tribunal appointed experts, you have all uh, the similar concerns around double hatting and, and conflicts of interests and delays and costs um, that are already being explored in other um, aspects of, of the reform process. So really it's um, uh, pays to think holistically and as, as Veronica has also highlighted, um, pays to think about how these approaches have, have been dealt with and even reformed in other settings and, and hopefully in a way that um, investment tribunals can uh, skip all the, all, uh, the, the kind of <laughs> negative baggage associated with some of these approaches and, and, and really kind of uh, skip ahead by learning, on, uh, learning from the, the approaches uh, and experience of other international courts and tribunals. Thank you so much, Esme, and thank you really to all of our panelists for offering, um, you know, really different perspectives, but very rich and very useful reflections on the, the paper. Um, I'm cognizant of the fact that we've been speaking a lot about what states um, do or don't do or how, to what extent they're engaged on these issues or not. Um, we haven't had the opportunity yet to hear from um, a participant coming from that um, government perspective. So I'm gonna turn over um, now to my colleague, Lucas. I believe we may be um, fortunate enough to be um, having one of those perspectives shared with us um, in just a moment. Over to you, Lucas. Yes, thank you very much, Sarah. And indeed, um, we have um, Mr. Muataz Hussein, who is a senior international investment agreement specialist at the General Authority for Investment of the Egyptian Ministry of Investment and International Cooperation. Mr. Hussein would like to share the perspective of a government official on the topic of compensation. So Mr. Hussein, you have the floor and you may uh, unmute yourself. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lucas. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to uh, congratulate the ISD and uh, uh, Ms. Sherlo for uh, this very important paper, which uh, tackles one of the very important uh, topics uh, nowadays uh, with regard to uh, investment arbitration and uh, investment treaty language. Uh, I'm speaking on my personal capacity uh, as a, one of the Egyptian team uh, responsible for treaty negotiations, investment treaty negotiations. Uh, 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 at the outset, I'd like to tackle an uh, important uh, issue uh, in my uh, humble perspective, that for many years, the arbitral awards in investment disputes had caught attention to procedural 
uh, clauses related to ISDS in is as the main and the only source of the problem. However, the immense and the huge amounts of compensations awarded in many recent arbitral awards have revealed that the substantive provisions in IAS had an important role to play also in this area. In this context, the classical provisions on taking of property and expropriation in the old generation of IAS tended uh, to ignore uh, going in depth uh, with regard uh, to the ways of calculating compensation through tackling only the fair market value of investment while granting ample discretion to the tribunal to apply the traditional technical mechanisms at the discount, as the discounted cash flows and other in the manner it perceives. However, the backlash of these practices uh, have raised concerns regarding the need for innovative provisions in new generation IAs on calculating compensations resulting from taking for property or losses. These innovative provisions uh, including paying attention to attaining balance uh, uh, between the public and the private interests of the host state and the affected investors, respectively. In this regard, uh, uh, many modern IAs uh, 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 have uh, started to include um, innovative provisions uh, regard and the clauses regarding the, this uh, compensation uh, details in the IAS language, uh, for example, beside the reference to uh, the fair market value uh, of investment um, immediately before the expropriation or being uh, publicly known, uh, it, uh, as I um, stated before, it tended to uh, stipulate on the the attaining the right balance between the public interest and the interest of those affected by uh, uh, taking for property and the related measures. Having, uh, having regard uh, uh, for all relevant circumstances and taking account of um, uh, elements such as the current and past uh, use of the property, also the history of its acquisition, uh, beside the market value of the investment and also the purpose, the public purpose behind the taking of property and the duration of investment and finally, the previous behavior uh, for investor. Uh, thus, I think we need uh, in the current near future uh, to concentrate more about creating this kind of innovative and including uh, new provisions uh, on compensation uh, in IAS in order to inform uh, not only um, the negotiate, other negotiators in IAS, but also the arbitrators in investment disputes, which may facilitate uh, uh, the process of calculating compensation and uh, would lead to uh, 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 more just uh, awards in the, um, in the investment claims. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um for coming and sharing this state perspective. I think it's incredibly important part of the discussion. And thank you also for, for noting, you know, we've been saying um, there's really not much treaty innovation out there. And as you rightly point out, one of the few um, really significant innovations is this um, balancing approach that we see um, in regards to expropriation. And it does come from um, a number of regional instruments from the African continent. And so I think that's a, a really great point to flag. So thank you so much, Moataz, for joining and, and sharing those comments. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left for some questions. So I'll, I'll turn once again to you, Lucas, to, to share whether we have some questions in the chat, um, either directed to any particular speaker or, or for the panel to tackle. So over to you. Thanks a lot, Sarah. So we also have uh, Valentin Wedraugo, who is an economic affairs advisor and ex expert in mining management at the Directorate of Industrial Cooperation of the Government of Burkina Faso. Um, um, Mr. Wedraugo would, would like to possibly make uh, an intervention in French. Uh, so Mr. Wedraugo, would you like to take the floor? Merci beaucoup, Lucas. Uh... Thank you very much, Lucas. Thank you to 
the whole team at I ISD for allowing us to participate in this important webinar on issues around compensation. My name is Wedrogo R. Valentin. I'm in charge of economic affairs in the Ministry of Industrial Development. We're in charge of negotiating investment issues. We work in the PNUDCI, and it's a pleasure for me to take the floor this morning and to give my perspective on this issue of reparations. I think that current investment treaties do not appropriately take into account the issue of compensation, how to uh, evaluate and what calculation method to use. This is usually a very important issue, especially for us developing countries, because investment compensations at international level is a significant concern for us. First of all, we believe that our states have not included innovative provisions around compensations, and those discussions might help to take into account aspects beyond traditional principles to evaluate compensations for investments, taking into account the sustainability of those compensations. As it was said earlier, taking into account the actual GDP of the state concerned, but also taking into account the contribution of that investment to reach sustainable development goals, which is to respect human rights, to protect the environment. Is this investment really contributing to realizing the SDGs? And if so, there might be a coefficient or a calculation method depending on the level of contribution to realizing the SDGs, the highest uh, the contribution, then that coefficient could be higher. And if it is contributing indeed, we can, if not a lower coefficient, depending on the level of contribution. We should also take into account the creation of tribunals, because when we talk about evaluating, we should take into account this equality around investment, because in most cases, arbitration tribunals are mainly made of international experts who need to completely understand the reality of those investments. So our proposal is to have reflections on this so that the understanding of the reality of the state is taken into account when choosing the members of the arbitration court. Thank you very much. I really want to thank you for your consideration and for allowing me to take the floor in this important webinar. Thank you so much and uh, have a good session. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I really appreciate having uh, the opportunity to hear um, not only a state perspective, but a, a developing country perspective and to hear some of these considerations which have been absent from the discussion so far around really contribution of investment to sustainable development. So thank you so much. Um, Lucas, I'll just hand back to you to see if we have some questions to go through in the chat in our remaining 10 minutes together. So thank you.
Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Sarah. We already have uh, two questions in French um, by Alpha Ibrahima Diallo on the chat. She's asking, and I'm quoting in French, dans le cadre des réformes initiées par les pays en développement, as part of the reforms initiated by developing countries, wouldn't be preferable for those countries to plan compensation clauses in case of a litigation Et pareil, existe-t-il un mécanisme de dialogue in the entre les EITs? Is there de also a dialogue mechanism between different jurisdictions as part of compensation to provide as part of the ISDS? And then we also received one question by Joshua Payne um, on the, in the Q&A box, who congratulates Esme on the publication of the paper. And he notes that the paper does not look at the um, Iran-US claims tribunal. And there are other recent claims commissions with substantial experience in awarding compensation, such as the UN Compensation Commission or the Eritrea-Ethiopia um, Claims Commission. So do you have a sense of whether looking at the practice of claims commissions might offer relevant or different insights for investment treaties and ISDS? And those are all the, uh, the questions on the chat. Thank you, Lucas. Um, for the first question, I had a little bit of trouble. I think the um, your your speech was not muted during the interpretation, so it was a bit hard to follow. So perhaps what I could suggest is, Esme, you um, tackle the second question, and then maybe, Lucas, we can come back to you to just give us an English um, summary of the first question. Thank you. Great. So um, if I heard it correctly through the translation, uh, the second question related to kind of fora in which states could share perspectives around these issues of compensation um, to kind of learn from one another's perspectives and approaches. Um, as far as I know, um, I mean, states may be doing this informally, uh, but probably the most formal uh, forum in which they could be sharing perspectives uh, on compensation is through the multilateral reform work that's taking place through UNSA trials working group three and, and compensation and approaches to reparation are specifically on the agenda of working group three, which really gives states um, a, a fairly good environment in which to share different perspectives um, and to pick up uh, approaches from different international courts and tribunals, should they so wish uh, as, as suggestions as part of that um, multilateral reform effort. Another area in which it, these conversations are likely happening uh, is uh, through the Energy Charter Treaty mod modernization process. Um, compensation specifically, again, uh, on the agenda of, of uh, those states. Uh, and the EU uh, made quite a detailed proposal at an early stage in relation to approaches to remedies, which is broadly in line with what it uh, has adopted through uh, CETA, uh, its agreement with Canada, um, and it reserved it at its right uh, to adopt more detailed rules at a later stage. And unfortunately, those negotiations are relatively opaque, so it's difficult to know what is specifically being discussed in that context. Um, they're likely to uh, reach some culmination in the near future. So it, it's likely that states uh, of, of the Energy Charter Treaty are, uh, are also talking about these approaches, but I think there's nothing to prevent uh, states from adopting different uh, fora and, and potentially also bilateral channels uh, to, to workshop ideas with other states. And, and potentially that's um, one area in which uh, think tanks like IISD uh, might provide uh, a particular kind of space for discussion. Should, should I answer Josh's question now as well? Yeah, so, so thanks very much for the question, Josh. And uh, really it, it uh, came down to what was possible to fit within the confines of this policy paper. And originally when we set out uh, talking about our, our ideas for this paper, it, it was gonna cover far fewer uh, courts and tribunals. And uh, we kind of made a, a wish list of courts and tribunals uh, that it, it would be good to include just based on kind of how, how high profile they are and the types of claims that they consider and how many uh, decisions on reparation that they've issued. Um, and really the paper grew uh, considerably from the, what was initially envisaged when we started talking about it. And uh, that's why you see 
the number of courts and tribunals that are canvassed uh, there now. Um, the Iran-US Claims Tribunal was uh, definitely the next uh, court or tribunal that, that we wanted to include, but we kind of had to draw a line uh, at some point. Um, and I really think that looking at those um, specific claims commissions uh, and, and claims tribunals would yield uh, further interesting insights and different practice. And, and probably kind of in the back of my mind, the, the thing that I think they might contribute, uh, which is maybe missing from uh, the paper is uh, a potentially more or different or refined approaches to assessing compensation uh, associated with contractual claims. Um, and uh, I, I think potentially further study there uh, could be quite interesting and yield some, some different options for consideration. Um, and they, they may as well have their own different approaches on some of the issues uh, canvassed in the paper, or they may have similar practice uh, to reinforce some of the conclusions in the paper. So really, as I, I note, um, in the intro to the paper, uh, omitting those bodies isn't, isn't meant to uh, make any statement as to their potential utility for these types of considerations. It, it really just reflected um, issues of, of time and scope for this particular paper. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Esme. And let me maybe reiterate the first question as I think it was hard to hear during the translation. Um, so the first question was, would it be preferable for developing countries to provide for compensation clauses in relation to ISDS uh, in, in their BITs? So I could have a go at this one. So, um, and, and just maybe to clarify the question. So uh, kind of, I guess, picking up maybe on what Martins and I were mentioning towards the end of our comments as part of the panel discussion. Um, uh, and maybe uh, Martins uh, can, can uh, address the question after me, because I think we have maybe slightly different approaches. Uh, like Martins, I think that um, at some point, more and more detailed clauses in treaties on these issues are unlikely to yield um, better practice. Uh, but I think that states could do slightly more in treaties uh, to at least give some guidance to tribunals as to what approaches they would like adopted. Um, and that can be at a, at a higher level of, of generality. So it could be um, uh, to kind of fill in the blank that, that uh, many of the panelists have been noting of uh, addressing, for example, uh, the, the standard or approach to compensation that should apply for um, unlawful expropriations to kind of counterbalance uh, what we already have in, in treaties around um, compensation for lawful um, expropriations at, at market rates. Um, so it could be kind of those sorts of approaches may be useful in treaties in, in specifying the type or standard of, of compensation that could apply to particular breaches. I think some of the practice we're seeing uh, in sort of fine tuning uh, around um, specifying, for example, that, that damages shouldn't be punitive or um, potentially uh, in respect of interest rates uh, or in relation uh, to uh, uh, specifying um, even currency of, of payment, uh, that they might be uh, useful and, and more uh, at a more specific level. Um, and again, I think uh, clauses potentially dealing with procedural innovations, you know, if states are wanting tribunals to specifically consider engaging experts or are wanting tribunals to engage with domestic mechanisms or domestic approaches to compensation, specifying that in the treaty would really clarify the approach. Um, but I don't think all of the reform can happen within treaty clauses. Uh, and I think that's where, you, you know, you're relying also on um, kind of in instruments and soft law on the side uh, and, and possibly also um, educating uh, uh, practitioners to argue these points in a way that gains traction with tribunals under the umbrella or rubric of what they can already do within treaties. So I think it's, it's kind of, you need a, a multifaceted approach and um, treaty clauses is, is one way to, to tackle some of these issues, but I don't think it's um, the silver bullet to, to uh, resolve all of them. Thank you so much, Esme, and, and thank you to those who shared questions in the chat. Um, we're about to close our, our webinar. Um, I wanted to kindly ask um, the interpreters in particular, if we could stay on just for 
perhaps um, five more minutes at the most, I'd like to give each of the panelists an opportunity just to share one very brief uh, closing reflection um, or comment or, uh, or message that they wanted to share um, before I hand over to Susie Nikiema to, to close us. So just a couple more minutes if, if that would be okay from our um, interpreters. Um, if I could perhaps uh, go clockwise on my screen. So we'll start with you Martins and then Simon and then Veronica and then I'll, I'll hand over to you Susie. Right. Well, I mean, as I said, I think I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the thrust of Esme's argument. And I think we probably, I'm almost trying to invent points of emphasis where we might differ for uh, purposes of the discussion. Uh, I think that probably for me, the key point is that there are different techniques for answering different issues. And I think, I think that Mr. Hussein's point is that to some extent, we could try to move these points into the primary rules, as it were. And that would take account of my concern that states may be wary because they don't want to create rules that are applicable to all breaches everywhere. And I think that the Dutch model BIT does it quite neatly, that it sets out the breach, the content of the expropriation, and then it also applies presumably creating a leg specialist secondary rule so that is one way of going and so i'm completely agreement with esme i guess i'm less certain that setting out bits on causality and punitive uh, no punitive damages is the way to go uh, because it's superfluous if arbitrators are good enough they would know it if they need to be told that something has gone wrong in the appointment process, so we should be troubled by the fact that they are helped by this language. So that I think is a different lab point, which perhaps goes to Mr. Odreolo's argument. Uh, interest, I think, is its own animal, because interest is something that actually is technical and can be handled uh, clearly and specifically. But I think that there's also, it has the opposite challenge. If you are being too specific in the treaties, you'll be overtaken by the world. So LIBOR is a good example. <laughs> if something were to be set now by reference to LIBOR, it would be inapplicable. So I think I think we have to be sensitive. And in that sense, I think that Esme's work has been fantastic in providing a lab and showing different tools for dealing with different issues. So inspiring states is absolutely the right way to go, but we have to fit it within the system as it exists now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Simon. Sure. Um, and I, I would just like to um, echo what Esme said at the end of her last intervention. Um, which is that sure treaty reform the first part was that treaty reform is it can be important and that that's the point has been made by mr Uedrago and um and mr ibrahima also um through his question uh, at least he asked about this um and um and uh, you know of course uh, it's not unusual for state parties uh, to react to the way in which the case law um, is being developed. We've seen this in other areas of investment law, example, for example, the uh, anti-Mafizzini um, uh, clauses uh, uh, on the scope of MFN clauses that very much reacted to the evolving jurisprudence. And we can see that you could have anti-type of practice or other that we're seeing um, developing in the investment treaty jurisprudence and compensation on the issue of uh, going concerns that I mentioned, um, incorporation of the country risk in, in the discount rate, um, shareholder claims for reflective loss, an issue on which the OECD actually has done quite a bit of work. So you could have, that's the first part, you could have uh, uh, some uh, tweaking and some fine tuning of treaties to avoid what some states are considering as abuses committed by investment treaty tribunals. The second part is that um, states should be careful, I think, to uh, preserve the flexibility to argue those points even under treaties that do not contain the clarifications. And as we mentioned, the role of counsel, and that very much echoes what I do in my practice, which is that even, even under a treaty that does not contain an, let's say, anti mafizzini clause or anti the type of anti um, going concern uh, type of issue um, uh, clause that we were anticipating could appear in these treaties. Um, the, your counsel for the state has to be able to um, to advance those positions if, if that's the state's understanding, even under treaties that 
uh, do not contain express clarifications. And so that's why we're seeing in treaty uh, drafting practice a lot of uh, formulations uh, such as for greater certainty, uh, for the avoidance of doubt. This is what we've always thought all along. Um, otherwise, there's a, you could really uh, shoot yourself in the foot. And I've seen arguments on, on the opposite side of the uh, table at hearings that oh, well, this treaty does clarify this point, but under the older treaties, that was not the intention of the parties. So um, that's the, the final point I wanted to make. Thank you so much. Veronica? Super, thank you. Um, so I think this paper is really terrific in just bringing together uh, a lot of the jurisprudence of different uh, institutions and showing how we can learn from each other. And that doesn't only apply to investment, but also, you know, from, from perspective of a human rights lawyer. I think one of the things I would highlight is that we need to be sort of conscious of the differences between permanent institutions versus non-permanent institutions, and specifically the link uh, between damages and compliance and vice versa. So what do I mean? So a lot of the time, right, the, the amount of damages that are being set is going to affect compliance. Um, and um, when it comes to permanent institutions, that also works the other way, so that the non-compliance from case to case is going to influence next time around how they set damages. And we've seen this across different permanent institutions that are very concerned about their own legitimacy, their own authority, and that when in the scope of their discretion, in, in the scope of what they can do and define equitable or reasonable, they will consider compliance. The question is to what extent non-permanent institutions should also be taking that into account or perhaps are. And that's still an open question that we need to uh, consider and test and study. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for those final reflections. I'd like to turn now to Susie Nikiyama who's going to uh, make some very brief closing remarks for our webinar. Thank you very much, Sarah. For the sake uh, of time, I will be very brief. First of all, by thanking all the panelists for uh, taking time to join us and for this very enriching paper. I would like also to thank, of course, all the ISD team for organizing this webinar, starting with you, Sarah, Lucas, Sophie, Niaguti, but also all those that work behind the scene, including our colleagues, um, uh, Sally and, and Lizian. Uh, thank you very much to the interpreter for your patience and sorry about running a bit late, but it shows that the discussion is so interesting. Um, and I would like to end with one uh, concluding remark is to say, I think that this discussion show the issue is important, something has to be done, and we are really at the beginning of the discussion to find the most appropriate and innovative and meaningful solutions that works for the system, but also taking into account the current reform of the old international investment regime. So I kind of ask you to stay standard with us. I hope this discussion gave you, uh, gave you a, a taste to read the paper. So please, the link is on the chat, uh, read it. I think it's, uh, it's very important. And last but not least, we have shared a, a link to an evaluation form on the chat. I kindly ask you to just very briefly take a few seconds to, to, feel, uh, to complete it. And thank you everyone again for your time, for joining us today. Uh, stay standard because we will continue to work on this issue, uh, to publish um, papers and to organize other webinar related to compensation. So have a nice day or a, a nice evening, depending on where you, you are based. Thank you everyone for, for your time today. It was a pleasure for us. Thank you. <laughs>